Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much and welcome to this evening's presentation as part of Native American Heritage Week on behalf of Native Americans for Community Action. Tonight we have two very um, welcomed and returning speakers uh, who will be sharing some information tonight. First, we will um, uh, I see a message in the chat box from Carolyn, but um, we will welcome questions. Um, just be sure to enter your questions in the chat box and our host will go ahead and um, manage those questions throughout the um, presentation this evening. Uh, first up, we will have Chef Lois Ellen Frank. Thank you so much. Um, Chef Frank provided a very welcome uh, presentation as well during a conference we hosted earlier this um, year. And so we really appreciate your uh, return and the information that you do have to share with us. For um, those of you, Chef is also a um, PhD. So Dr. Chef Lois Ellen Frank is joining us this evening. Uh, she is Kiowa and Sephardic um, residing in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And she um, is also a Native food historian, culinary anthropologist, educator, photographer, organic gardener, and a James Beard award-winning cookbook author for her book, Food to the Southwest Indian Nations. She's the chef owner of Red Mesa Cuisine, uh, a Native American catering company specializing in the revitalization of ancestral Native American cuisine with a modern twist. Thank you so much, Chef Lois. Thank you for having me. So uh, I'll get started. Um, I'm going to be presenting tonight on the uh, um, uh, reconnecting to uh, culture. We're going to feed the body and nurture the soul. And then uh, Walter will be talking uh, after I present. So um, I, it's really important when we talk about being able to reconnect to culture. And I'm going to go through some foods and talk a little bit about what does that mean? How do we uh, feed the body and nurture the soul? And um, it really surrounds food. It really surrounds us connecting back to our ancestral roots. So what we do know is that our ancestors used food for physical health, right? So eating and feeling good about eating, but also to connect to culture for a mental and a spiritual health and wellness. And this is really important when we think about feeding the body and nurturing the soul, because it, in native ideology, everything is connected. So beginning food is more than something to eat. Food is our medicine. Food is our sovereign right, and food is, in fact, the key to our health and wellness. And so when we use Native American ancestral plant-based foods from the past, uh, this is both physical and mental wellness in the future. Uh, and we have to look and say, well, what happened to Native American cuisine? What happened to our foods uh, over history? And uh, we can go back 10,000 years and we can say up until first contact and here in the Southwest, that would have been with the Spanish. Although I'm speaking to all of you in English, so we know that the English had a profound impact as well. Uh, what were the foods that we ate? Then uh, first European contact from about 1492 into the 1800s. And I think a really good example here would be uh, sheep were introduced to the Navajo and now sheep are used for weavings and sheep uh, really are used, uh, there's a lot of creation stories about that with the Diné or the Navajo people. The government issue, so we go into the mid 1800s, forced relocation, my tribe moved off of it ancestral homelands into Oklahoma. And whenever you're displaced, whenever you're moved, uh, it affects what you know in the world. It affects how you are able to gather plants. And then where we are now, this is my most favorite, period, the new native. And this is where uh, native people get to uh, really take a look at um, their foods 
and um, uh, what this does. And um, the first, the pre-contact period, has tons of beautiful plants and foods for health and wellness. And of those are the magic eight, corn, beans, squash, chili, tomato, potato, vanilla, and cacao. And these are all foods that native people gave to the world that did not exist anywhere outside of the Americas. This is really important to contextualize. So the Italian tomato, the Irish potato, uh, the British chips, uh, Asian chilies all did not exist. So corn goes back close to that 10,000 uh, period. Um, its ancestor is a wild grass. And what's fascinating about corn is corn has many layers of meaning. Corn is a storyteller. Corn is our ceremony. Corn is song and prayer and maiden and mother and sister and healer and medicine. Corn is sustenance. And so food and cuisine and art all encompasses corn and that is the essence of life. What's fascinating about corn is it's a perennial. It has to be planted every year. It is indigenous to the Americas. It needs humans, it needs us. And so it is considered to be a gift uh, from the creator to many tribes. Corn is used in our ceremonies. This is Calandra. She is gonna go through her Kinalda and she is going to use corn as part of that. So again, we're reconnecting our food with our culture, our culture with food. And so I love this because this is Mara Fiona Celestua. So she's Hopi and Dene. And she started very, very, very young. Uh, corn was used as her teething. She became uh, five. She started to harvest. She learned how to use food. And then she graduated and now she's in college. And so food has connected her life all the way through these different transitional periods. And so food connects us to our life and our life source. And the more we understand our food and our culture, the more we can carry that with us. And that becomes part of uh, our healing process. Tiffany using corn pollen, she's going to offer that to the land. And then that land is going to produce corn and squash and tomatoes and sunflowers. And uh, on this farm, they're going to be using dry farming. Beans, my sustenance in a pot. I think people should be eating beans every day uh, in the form of hummus or any type of food. Lots of fiber. This is a perfect, perfect superfood. Low in uh, uh, sugar uh, for diabetics. So this reduces blood sugar, good for blood pressure, improves cholesterol. It's just important. And corn and beans, uh, two sisters. This is my favorite of all the beans. Bobby from the Tohono Otam and the Akmil Otam, 23 to 30% higher in protein than any other bean on the planet. So again, squash, the third sister of those three is considered a superfood. We're moving into our winter squash. Butternut is the healthiest, lots of fiber, antioxidants. And so we have two kinds of squash in our native history. One is summer squash, which means you eat the outside. And one is winter squash, which we're moving into now, especially as we go into uh, um, our fall and harvest uh, holidays. And so uh, winter squash means it has a hard shell on the outside. We do not eat the outside. So corn, beans, and squash, almost every nutrient known to sustain human life, we could live off these three and these three alone. But it's not only the nutrients they provide, it's how they grow. Corn needs nitrogen, beans give nitrogen, uh, squash has big leaves and it shades the ground, keeping moisture in and weed growth out. So uh, again, very, very uh, important. Chilies, uh, lots of medicine. These are, um, one green chili has the equivalent uh, uh, in vitamin C of six oranges. So chilies release endorphins in the body. They're just sort of our Native American cure-all. And uh, here in the state of New Mexico, uh, where I am in Santa Fe, 
uh, our state question says red or green. So what are they asking you? They're really asking you, what kind of chili do you want? Do you want red or do you want green? So chilies, again, native and very important. Uh, and so as the body, when you eat a chili, it's hot. It sends a signal to the brain. These are the body's natural painkillers and they leave you with a feel good. They leave you feeling good. This is a little bit of a high. And so chilies are giving us this natural defense mechanism uh, uh, to feel good when we eat the food. So again, connecting us health and wellness and uh, our, our culture. And so tomatoes, again, vitamin A, vitamin C, and uh, lots of nutrients. Lycopene is, is a great antioxidant found in tomatoes. Potatoes uh, go back seven to 10,000 years. Uh, the Inca were the first native people to actually uh, domesticate and cultivate uh, this food. And so again, lots of carbohydrates and protein and fiber. And uh, I'm just gonna say, because as I was preparing this, that I don't think fried French fries or potato chips fit into this. What we're really talking about are whole potatoes. Uh, I know um, potato chips for me have salt and fat and they're, they're, they taste good, but this is not really what we wanna do. We wanna eat the whole potato, the sweet potato, uh, the colored potatoes uh, for health and wellness. Vanilla, um, highly valued for its flavor. I think what's most fascinating to me, how did the ancestors know that this bean, this pod from a vanilla was going to have so much flavor and going to pair perfectly with cacao? So cacao, these are the, what we call the sweet sisters. Again, rich in fiber. They also release endorphins. So chilies, cacao, which we know is chocolate. The darker the chocolate, the healthier it is. Uh, and exercise are, are those endorphin releasing uh, foods and uh, exercise that really help the body. Wild foods, very, very important. We can't do cultivated without wild, uh, wild is a part of the diet. So the pecan, which is really big and headed westward, actually is an Algonquin. So it's a native word, meaning a nut that the crows could break. And it was the crows, in fact, that helped it migrate. It's the number one uh, export here in the state of New Mexico in the millions and millions of dollars. So one half cup, 691 calories. Pinon, a little bit better, one half cup, 673 calories. And we can look at some of the Pueblo and the Diné or the Navajo traditions as well as the Apache and say that when there was no wild uh, game, these nuts provided the good fats and lots of protein. So now these can make up some of those plant-based calories and foods that we need uh, in our diet to feel good and to have nutrients. The choke cherry, which I planted actually in my front yard, very important to the Kiowa people. And uh, we harvested, even during uh, this year, which was sort of an, an odd year, uh, 33 pounds of choke cherries just from our edible landscape bushes in the front yard. And so we cooked those, processed those, and now they're in the freezer uh, for later use. Teas and all kinds of plants are medicines that can help uh, this particular tea, Indian tea or Navajo tea, Pueblo tea, Cota in Spanish, uh, lots of medicinal. It's a blood purifier when it's prepared without sugar and uh, stimulates the kidneys. So again, all of these plants, and this is one of my favorite, this is a weed. Uh, it's a great weed, um, higher in omega-3s than salmon. So this is something, uh, those omega-3 fatty acids that we want in our diet. And so you can freeze it, you can dry it, and it's got lots of dietary uh, minerals. And so food is our medicine. It nurtures us and it sustains us. And all of these very, very important. And I just wanna introduce sort of a concept to all of you uh, the term food sovereignty, what does that mean? Uh, it really means food justice, food security. How do we as Native people have security, especially when we're in remote areas? Uh, the environment comes into play here. And this is all dependent on something called TEK. And TEK stands for Traditional Ecological Knowledge. 
And this is how our information is passed on. And so native communities, we can produce and grow and harvest foods. Uh, and this reconnects us to our land, to our community and our culture. So our ceremonies have always honored what we do to give thanks. This is a form of our food sovereignty. And so TEK is how we pass on. We do this orally. And many uh, Western uh, science and Western classes have not given validity to our oral traditions, but our oral traditions have validity. And we pass on information a little differently than Western science. So we might not write things down, we might not write a recipe, but how do we pass it on through a song, through a story, and through a belief? And these are as viable and as valuable as any Western science. So we want these two sciences to work together in tandem because passing on this knowledge is vital uh, to uh, generations. And so I'm gonna show you some pictures of my garden. I took barren land, uh, we mulched it, we added uh, straw and we grew a garden with three sisters. This reconnected us to place you can see. Uh, we planted it downhill so any of the water would run down. Here you can see the abundance of the corn and the beans. We planted flowers so that bees would come, right? Uh, chilies and tomatoes. And then we waited for the first frost. Walter and I harvested this. Here we are harvesting our corn and we did blue and white traditional corn, which was then ground and used. So here you can see we've had a frost. We're harvesting that corn. And so this mental and physical connection to our land and connection to the culture reconnects us. You know, they say that when you take your shoes off and you put your feet on the land, on the ground, it roots you, it connects you to your culture. And so, food and our connection to the land are revitalized through any type of gardening process, touching the earth, touching the seeds, growing the seeds. This is vitally important to our well-being. And not only physically, the food is going to nurture us, but that connection, uh, these nutrients, is physical, mental, uh, emotional well-being as well. And so here you can see a garden, we grew herbs. I call this the upper garden. Uh, again, flowers, so those bees come. And then look at during the season, we have herbs and we have wheat, which we can dry and grow. And all of this very, very important, again, connecting us. For me personally, when I water the plants, I talk to the plants, uh, I nurture the plants, but I also nurture myself. There's something about giving life and watering my sunflowers that nurtures every part of my being. And so just giving a plant water brings life, but it nurtures us in a connection and a way that may not, we may not be able to talk about tangibly. So this idea of food and mood and connecting, but we're not the only ones. Here, Tsuki Pueblo has done the same thing. They took barren land, they have fruit trees, they have berries, they have hoop houses. And I, of course, bring my students. And so when they hoe and we use our physical self, again, look at her connection. You can almost see my student, uh, Janessa, touching the earth and connecting. Look at them down on the ground, touching the earth and connecting to culture. And so this is very important. Uh, processes like being able to dig a pit. Uh, this is Walter's family, his father and his uncle and his cousins, digging a hole, putting corn in the ground, roasting that corn, hanging it to dry. Again, that circle of life, that connection to culture. Uh, some farmers, here's Wilmer, uh, he's going to be using a dry farming method. Some farms have irrigation, but how do these plants survive. There's, it's because they're sung to, they're spoken to, they're offered to. They provide food for the communities that plant them. This is from my student, uh, Telly Tungovia, from this year, May of 2020, in my indigenous food class. And she did a slide on why do we plant? 
Well, that's a great question. We carry out our way of life. For her in Hopi, they carry out their calendar. Corn is planted, ceremonial, food, weddings, social events, prayer, and other. So again, it's much larger than just food. It's about having a good heart. It's about gathering families together to teach younger boys uh, through stories how to renew these bonds. So again, this is all about connecting to culture. Here is Kelly going through her uh, uh, ceremony, we're learning how to grind corn, being given corn, then she's going to learn how to make piki, which is a paper bread using just cornmeal, ash, and water, and then that is going to be eaten. So spiritual, physical, emotional, all of these well-beings coming into play. So what we really want to do is focus on Native American grown and sourced ingredients. This is our wellness for our community, as well as economic wellness, right? That's a form of wellness. How do you make a living in a remote area? And what's fascinating is there are little grandmas now selling culinary ash on their uh, Etsy. Uh, so they're able to make a living making a traditional product and being able to sell it. And so uh, I think um, this year has taught us really how to use the internet. And I, I prize, I promote the little grandmas all the time, buy the ash from them. Walter and I, of course, could do the ash, but why not support a little grandma in a remote area who can make an economic living doing something very, very traditional. So uh, this is really important. The new native, what is the new native? It's really these past three periods, uh, food as medicine being fused together, bringing us all back together and for the first time in history native communities can decide what is on their own table what are the foods they want to serve and every community is going to define it a little differently it's not the same we're not one size fits all so each community can decide what foods do they want to share how do they want to share them how do they want to present them and so again this is all important. Sunflower cakes, one of my favorites. It's just ground sunflowers with blue corn and water served with an herb jelly. And so again, taking these traditional foods and nurturing us uh, in some cases where that knowledge may be broken or forgotten or lost, what we can do is we can go into a community. Uh, we worked with both Salt River and Gila River. Many of the community members didn't know how to grill, process, or clean their cactus, which is a great food, especially for diabetics, because of the mucous membrane and the regulation of blood sugar. And so we were able to show them how to do that, make a delicious, nutritious salad, and we are reconnecting, revitalizing these connections to culture. So education, very important. We need pro uh, programs like this. We need everyone to watch. We need to reclaim these foods, cooking techniques, education. We need culinary professionals. We want everyone, all ages, to cook. We need workshops. And then we can emphasize how the benefits of using an ancestral plant-based diet can improve health and connect our youth uh, to their culture. So this is vital. Uh, here we are in the Santa Fe Public School Indian Education Program teaching kids. We're using uh, that feast. Um, and here is a six year old. Uh, this is Isabella Davis, and she might need a little help cutting, but she is empowered to make a plant based stew. We have 10 year olds making no fry fry bread. And then we, while we're watching them, we want them to develop skills and be able to do it on their own. And look at that expression in that child's face, Jude, uh, of being able to grill this bread on his own. It absolutely is empowering and connecting uh, to culture. And so students all ages, I love bringing in the ancestral tools, our stirring sticks, our all kinds of tools with those contemporary uh, um, stainless steel pots in a contemporary kitchen, old and new together. This is cornmeal 
with SUMAC. And so all of these programs uh, and the Physicians Committee has been amazingly uh, supportive of us to do this and be able to teach classes. Look at this mother-daughter. She's so proud that her daughter was able to learn how to cook ancestral traditional foods. Uh, these are my students making blue corn mush, lots of different ways. Here we do it on the right in a very contemporary way. Blue corn, white corn, boiled berries. Again, uh, making these foods, it feels good. It connects us to culture and uh, revitalizes everything associated with. So a really good way to understand this is to look at our medicine wheel. We wanna take what are the fruits in our communities? What are the grains in our communities? What are the vegetables in our communities? What are the beans in our communities? And then we wanna remember, look at the outside, that beautiful blue water, right? Water is also an ingredient in our food. Water is life. Water makes all of these plants grow. So that medicine wheel connecting us and we can all as individual communities decide which of these uh, particular foods make up our plate, which is on our native plate. How do we reintroduce in, in, and revitalize the foods uh, this is a brochure that Walter did, a pinto bean spread. So this is sort of a native version of hummus. Uh, look at how beautiful that is, those vegetables. Again, uh, using that for health and wellness and reconnecting us to culture, taking hominy corn, making it into a stew or a side and using that again as part of our health and wellness and connection to culture. This is my brochure and these are all available to download for free for all of you. You can take any of these recipes. One of my favorites, pinto bean and spinach tacos. Yum, yum, yum. With homemade corn tortillas, you can see tomato in there. Again, foods that are nurturing the body uh, and feeding the soul feeding the body and nurturing the soul. So those are sort of interchangeable. Healthy salad, how do we make sprouts and grow microgreens? Again, part of this connection to culture uh, and healthy foods. And what I wanna sort of close with is, I don't know how many of you know this, but we're using the spiral design on this plant-based corn soup our knowledge as native people starts at the beginning of time and spirals outward. Four dots represent four generations, child, adolescent, middle-aged, and elder. If any of those dots don't know how to pass on, how to make the corn mush, or how to plant, or how to sing to the corn, or how to do any of the things that vitally connect us, it's broken. It takes one generation. So we must continue our languages and continue our songs and our stories and our prayers and our recipes and our wild harvest gathering. And we must pass this on to generations. So these traditional heirloom foods of the past are really our future. We can do this by teaching our children and our youth about these foods, how to grow them, how to harvest them, all the knowledge, all the wisdom of the elders, and we can pass this on for our physical, mental, and spiritual and emotional well being. So, food connects us to who we are, how we live in the world, how we look at the world, and this is vitally important. So, it doesn't matter if you grow up in a city or on the reservation, all of this is vital and anyone can learn it, everyone can learn it, we want to. And I'm gonna end by reading this quote. This is Tidra, who came to me when she was at IAIA. When I'm around native foods, it reminds me of my grandma's house because that's what I got to eat when I would go back home. Now, I'm trying to learn the importance of making the same food for myself and keeping these native foods alive in my own life. And so we see that our youth need and want to learn this. And I believe that it's up to us as educators to make sure that they do. And so uh, um, conferences and sessions and classes, all of this uh, vitally important. So here is all of my contact information. You're welcome to take a screenshot of that. 
uh, you're welcome to uh, contact us. Walter and I have dedicated our lives to, to doing this, passing this information on, and uh, we couldn't do it without the support of our sponsors. So I just wanna thank them. I'm going to uh, stop sharing and pass it over uh, to uh, you and we will uh, introduce Walter. Thank you, Chef Frank. Um, I'm always amazed at the power of food in terms of wellness. And um, as Chef Frank, Chef Frank indicated um, in her presentation, the um, presentation tonight has been sponsored by the Physicians Committee for, um, for Responsible Medicine. And so um, we will be uh, moving on to Chef Walter for his portion of tonight's presentation. Um, Chef Walter was born in Pinon, Arizona. He is Diné uh, and grew up traditionally uh, learning the traditional cooking ways um, by watching the elders. He began cooking professionally in 1992 in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is now a chef at Red Mesa Cuisine, uh, a Native American catering company. He was the first Native American chef to cook at the, at the James Beard House in New York City. He won the James Lewis Award in 2008 from BCA Global for his work as a Native chef. Chef Walter, thank you so much. I want to introduce myself. My name is Walter Whitewater, and um, a place called Pena in Arizona. That's where I'm from. And my clan is Kilichin and Shlom. Toham, Bashishin, Kapa, Bashishin, Kilichin, Bashin, and that's the way I was um, brought up. And then I, uh, um, you know, grew up, grew up my uh, grew up my years. So how I used to eat, um, for some of us, the word is whatever it affects us by what we're eating and um, affects our, our body. And, and uh, we're diagnosed with something else when the doctor sees, sees things. And um, let me get some more, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyway, um, so my, my story is about, I was diagnosed with a colon. Um, Palettes. The, the doctor saw that and um, my thoughts were like, what happened here? I thought I was eating good. Hey, you know, because I work in a restaurant and um, I eat whatever it, it was. Um, I thought they, everything was the best food that I, I could eat and make myself healthier. I guess the word is, where did I got, got myself in trouble? Then looking back at what I went through and uh, the, the life that I, I going through and diagnose with what you eat and it will get you there, you know? It's just something that I, um, I learned from a, a kidney stone. That was the first one. Then another one is, uh, has to do with, um, with sugar. There's something that really, um, that made me think when I end up in the hospital, then they check my blood and all that. I had a high blood, um, pressure with sugar and all that. So it made me realize it's time to change. And some, the way I see a lot of native people today, they kind of avoid that, like it's, it's gonna go away. It never goes away until you make it go away. And the way I look at it, it's like, well, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to eat? What, what am I supposed to do? So the I started asking questions, having a second opinion, and so the doctors asked me to, they're going to take uh, my intestine out, a foot a food, um, long, and put me back together. And it is, that doesn't please me. So I kept asking before I went into the hospital to make myself, what is the best way to go about this? So the best way to go about it was, and through, through Lois and Carolyn and, you know, and so change, changing your diet, because I was a meat eater, of course I did, I loved it, you know? And all the things that I, that brought me there and, and having problems, I love all those food. And I, I enjoyed it, but I had to think twice about how do I need to get out of this? So from there, 
I didn't hesitate or whatever it is. You know what? I didn't wait around for a couple of weeks, couple of months. Well, I wait until that. Nothing like that. I once I I realized that's when I start changing. I start eating um, vegetables, nuts, beans, um, fruits. You know, so that's what changed me, and to where I want to make myself better. I want it to live. I guess the word is, and I didn't want it to have a big scar across my belly, and you know I didn't want that, and so I wanted to stay who I am. Look at myself. Look, look what I did. So I lean more in that direction. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't easy, but I fell here and there. But in six months, I realized, and to where at the same time, um, running up to a hill, way like oh. Um, quite a ways, I ran up and realized that, hmm, before that, I used to never do that. You know, I, I always seemed to always run and get tired. But here I am, I made it all the way up and I said, oh, the food kicked in. And then I realized, hey, I'm going to have a fried bread. Let's see what we'll do. And then it didn't sit well with me. And certain things, I, I, I tried to go back into my old diet. It didn't work out. So, okay, I see what's happened because... I realized how my mind changed, my, my, my whole inside of me, it changed. So I started leaning. So my fruit became a meat, my veggies, all these things that I, I ate, you know, that, that became a meat. And, I, and to this day, I don't miss it, you know. I just don't, I don't think about going out, buying a steak or whatever it is, you know. My, my steak is um, squash or whatever it is in the veggie. And, and so that's my, my, my way of um, changing my life. And when the doctor tells you, hey, got to change, that means you have to change. You have to listen. The only way these things work is do you want to change it? And that's the way I, I changed and it, and it helped me. And here I am. And so when I went through all my, my surgery, they removed everything. Then I um, came out of it and then I start eating in that direction, going, going, being healthier, you know? And then like a couple of months, maybe like a year or something, something like that. I went back and they, they, they checked me again. And guess what? There's nothing. What have you been eating? So, hey. And, and so all the things were, um, was hurting me, hurting myself with it. And it was all gone. So that kept me. I can do it again, you know, that kept me going to in that direction that I, I wanted to. And then I turned around, I want to help the others that needed help. So anyway, that's my um, short story. And, and um, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to help anyone that, that needs help. And so that's my, my food of uh, medicine that, that, that cures, will cure you. Yeah. Oh, Chef Walter, yeah, yeah. And uh, Chef Frank, thank you so much to the both of you for sharing your cumulative knowledge um, and providing that uh, testimony about food um, serving as medicine. And as Indigenous people, we knew that. And that's why we gravitated towards the food that we have in our traditional diets. So um, next up, we'll have Dr. Carolyn Trapp um, presenting on uh, tonight. She is a nurse practitioner with more than 20 years of experience. She's currently the Director of Diabetes Education and Care for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So thank you so much for um, uh, sponsoring tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, they are based out of Washington, D.C., and they, they are a nonprofit organization working to prevent and treat chronic diseases with good nutrition instead of pills and surgery. Thank you so much and welcome Dr. Trapp. Thank you so much, Tellerita. I really appreciate that very kind introduction and I'm honored to be part of this program tonight. Really, after you've had the experience of hearing Chef Lois and Chef Walter and the wisdom that they have, um, what more do you need? But it occurs to me that diabetes is a 
um, a Western disease, of a disease that was not native. And I've been working with people with diabetes now for many years. And um, I wanna share a little bit about my experiences. Um, my ex I started out using a lot of medication to help people with diabetes. And I thought I was doing good for people. They had good numbers, um, but the disease never went away. And I saw people still go on to develop heart disease and kidney failure and other problems. So I was really inspired to learn more about diet. And I've had the privilege now of knowing Chef Lois and Chef Walter for 11 years, and I've learned so much from them. And I think this is a good uh, partnership, and I hope that you'll agree. So I wanna begin just by uh, pointing out the obvious, that the SAD diet, have you heard this term before, the standard American diet, is linked to higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, as Chef Walter mentioned, um, colon polyps that can lead to colon cancer. And um, fortunately, uh, we also have good evidence that shows there's a different route and that a plant-based diet is linked to lower rates of diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's disease. Also, as we're all worried about COVID, we might think about the link to diet. You know, I think we've all heard the importance of, of maintaining uh, uh, social distancing and washing our hands and using bleach and water to disinfect surfaces and uh, just being very careful uh, with how close we are to people to prevent the spread of disease and wearing a mask, of course. And all of those things are really important. But is there more that we can do? Absolutely there are some really important ways that we can take care of ourselves. And one of the first things is to get some physical activity, make sure you're getting a good night's sleep. And if you smoke, this is a great time to quit smoking. But another really, really important part of good self-care that we're focusing on tonight is what we eat. And we know that plant foods promote health. I want to share with you tonight three lessons about nutrition from different places on the globe. These include Norway, the United States, and Okinawa, Japan. So let's start with Norway. Um, Norway was involved in World War II, and many of you are familiar with the story of the brave Navajo code talkers and their very important role in helping the United States uh, victory in World War II. But a story that you might not be aware of is what happened um, in the little country of Norway, where uh, I want to show you this chart. And this chart goes back before the war started, and it's showing you the high rates of heart disease. So all of these um, lines are showing you the number of people who died from heart disease every year. And they're um, per 10,000, so, so here, uh, 30,000, 30,000 people a year, uh, 32,000 people per year were dying of heart disease in the years up to 1940 when the war started. And then look what happened how heart disease fell during the war. And that's a really surprising observation, isn't it? Because you would think that the stress of war would actually increase the rate of heart disease. But in reality, the rate dropped way down until the war ended, and then the rates went back up. So what happened during this time? Well, the Nazis came in and they took away the livestock. So there were no steaks or hamburger. There were no, um, people weren't eating pork and they weren't eating chicken. So they were eating a largely plant-based diet, right? And heart disease went away. And here's another visual of that. So on this side of the screen, you can see a wide open blood vessel. And this is a blood vessel that's been exposed to all kinds of fat in the diet and the blood vessel becomes blocked and circulation, uh, blood can't get through and 
people have heart attacks because of that. So in some way, the war was good for people's health. So let's think about how diet has changed in the United States over recent years, in which the rates of diabetes and other chronic diseases has gone way up. So what's changed? Well, the first thing everybody is going to tell me is we're eating more sugar. And that is absolutely true. This is a very busy chart, but it shows here total sweeteners. So that's sugar, uh, high fructose corn, oops, I'm sorry, high fructose corn syrup together. And people are averaging as much as 80 pounds of these sweeteners per person per year. Um, so sugar is way up there, absolutely. And that's not a health food. But there are other foods we've been eating a lot more of that may surprise you. So first of all, let's just think about meat. And way back in the 1900s, um, the average adult was eating about 124 pounds of meat per person per year. And you can see how that number's gone up. To 2004, it was up to over 200 pounds of meat per person per year. And just think about how has, have lives changed between 1909 and 2004? We're less active. We're not hunting for that meat. Um, we're going to the grocery store and getting it on, on a styrofoam uh, tray, right? And it's very easy to obtain or we're going through the drive through So we're expending less energy and we're eating more meat. Now that number's dropped a little bit. In 2012, it dropped to about 180 pounds per person per year, but that's still a lot more than we used to eat. That's total meat. We can separate out chicken and look at how much chicken's gone up over the last hundred years. We've gone from about 10 pounds per person to about 61 pounds per person in 2006. Now that's come down a little bit, but it's still a lot of chicken. Uh, we, we're eating a lot of chicken. And cheese is another food that we never ate much of. Uh, back in 2000, I mean, 1909, we ate about four pounds per person. In 1960, uh, we were up to about eight pounds per person. Um, I think that's when the commodities program started providing cheese to people. Um, and, and pizza became very popular, another way that we were eating more cheese. 2012, the average adult eats about 33 and a half pounds of cheese per person per year. And that, that's a lot of calories. Cheese is about 70% fat. So this is not a health food. I have realized in recent years that much of what I was taught about nutrition was wrong. And um, as an example of this, let's go to our third place in the country. I wanna to talk to you about Okinawa, Japan and about the blue zones. Now, Okinawa, um, the indigenous people of Okinawa traditionally live very long lives. They live to be 90 to 100 in good health. And the story of the people of Okinawa was written up recently in this book called The Blue Zones. And The Blue Zones, this was a book titled by uh, researchers, a team of researchers and photographers from National Geographic magazine. They went around the world and they found out where were people living the longest. And they came back to their office and they had a map and they circled those places with a blue magic marker. So that's how it became known as the Blue, no blue Zones. And Okinawa, Japan is one of the people, one of the places where people live the longest. And why would you think that is? What are people doing in Okinawa? Well, one thing is they live very active lives. Um, they have close family connections, which we know are important. Um, but their diet is really interesting. Now, what would you think the people of Okinawa eat? And you can see here, um, this woman is near the water. They're surrounded by water. So you might think that they eat a lot of fish um, because it's Japan. You might also think they eat a lot of, of rice. Um, and, and in reality, they eat a little bit of fish. They eat a fair amount of rice and other grains. But what do they eat the most of? Well, this, oops, sorry, this pie chart shows you that 70% of their diet is sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes. And it's such a surprise because have you all heard that you should avoid carbohydrates to prevent high blood sugar um, and to prevent diabetes? But sweet potatoes are a carbohydrate. 
Now they are a healthy carbohydrate. They are an unprocessed carbohydrate. You know, unless you cut them into strips and put them in the deep fryer and make French fries out of them, they're really healthy food. So we can learn a lesson from the people of Okinawa. We can eat potatoes and we can eat rice and grains and beans and fruits and vegetables. And that's a way to a long, healthy life. Only about very, very tiny parts of this pie chart are any kind of animal products. Um, let me bring you to Indian country where we have a study that shows that when people um, are eating, when Native Americans are eating processed meat, they have higher rates of diabetes. And this is a study called the Strong Heart Study and it was conducted, um, it started in 2000, it was, they followed people for five years in Arizona, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Oklahoma. And they found that uh, anybody who ate any kind of spam or hot dogs or bacon or sausage, lunch meats, had a higher risk of developing diabetes. And they found there was no safe amount. So even a little bit um, over time increased the risk. Yet these foods do not come with warning labels. So I want to deputize everybody watching this program today. You now have this information and I want to encourage you to share it. These uh, canned meats are convenient, but they are not health foods by any stretch. And let me share the story with you of uh, Marjolene. Uh, she is an educator, a health educator, who uh, loves to share her own personal victory over diabetes. She was embarrassed when she was diagnosed with diabetes because she was teaching nutrition and she thought she should already have this information to be able to prevent herself from getting the disease. She was on medication. And when she changed to a whole food plant-based diet. She went back to eating the traditional foods, eating lots of corn and beans and uh, squash. She lost weight. Her blood sugar got better. Her blood pressure got better. She was able to get off her medication. And she also reports that in her job, she had to uh, travel a lot, drive across the Navajo Nation. She got in and out of the car a lot. She was sitting a lot. And she used to have all kinds of joint pain. And when she changed to this diet, she found her joint pain went away and she had a lot more energy. One more really important bit of science that I wanna share with you around plant foods is around food and mood. Because these chronic diseases are chronic, but wouldn't it be nice if you could do something to make yourself feel better every single day? And getting chronic disease under control is certainly one way to feel better, but also just what about things like anxiety? Well, this was a study, we call it the GEICO study because it was done at the GEICO insurance company. They sell car insurance. And it was done in 10 different cities with 281 people. And it found that over 18 weeks, that people who followed a plant-based diet, that's this green line, their score on a test um, that measured depression, their depression got better. And also um, their anxiety got better just with change in diet. In another study, let's see, um, this was a study comparing people eating an omnivorous diet, so a, a diet that included um, meat and animal products like milk compared to those eating a plant-based or vegan diet. And you can see here the red is the meat and dairy diet and the green is the plant-based diet. And you can see in depression, anxiety, feelings of stress, is lower in the people eating a plant-based diet. Okay, so as Chef Lois explained beautifully, uh, this graphic is the power plate, and these are the foods that we wanna encourage everybody to fill up on, fruits, whole grains, beans, and vegetables. And also enjoy water instead of cow's milk, and it's not pictured, but small amounts of nuts and seeds are also really healthy, but they're really high in calories. And your ancestors didn't eat them out of jars or cans, right? Um, so we're not meant to sit down and eat them by the handful. Um, one handful a day is, is a really good amount. And then vitamin B12 is the one vitamin that's recommended because this is a vitamin that used to be in the soil, but it's largely depleted. And 
Um, if you're low in B12, it can cause anemia or nerve damage or even memory problems. So that's the one supplement that's really important to take. So what foods are you going to eat? What's recommended? Well, if you're looking for ideas, let me suggest oatmeal, but not plain oatmeal. You can decorate your oatmeal with all kinds of fruits and berries and dried fruits and, and nuts. This is a delicious, hearty breakfast. Uh, also, uh, here's, here's a, a black bean chili served three different ways. You can put it in a wrap, you can enjoy it in a bowl, or you can mix it uh, with with uh, kale and squash and quinoa and have a delicious bowl. So lots of, of delicious, healthy ideas. One question that always comes up is what about protein? If you're not eating meat, are you gonna be protein deficient? And you can see how strong Walter and Lois look. Um, and you know we're not eating animal foods. And uh, here's examples of ideas of what to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And this is a high protein diet. The World Health Organization says we need just 45 to 55 grams of protein a day. And here you can get all of that from plants. Another really important nutritional benefit to eating a high protein plant-based diet is that it's also really high in fiber. Now fiber is one of those really boring nutrition words, but let me just point out to you that fiber has the benefit, oops, excuse me, of being really filling. And I wanna talk more about fiber, but I also just wanna share some examples. And this came from my friends, the nutritionists on the Navajo Nation of foods that maybe are commonly eaten, but not traditional and foods that you could replace. So instead of cheese, enjoy a little bit of avocado or nuts or seeds for that nice um, oil, oily taste. Um, instead of fried eggs and spam, enjoy beans and corn tortillas and spinach, or it's not native, but widely available and inexpensive rolled oats, maybe with a banana or frozen berries or some nuts and fresh fruit. Um, Cheerios with a non-dairy milk, like soy milk or almond milk, um, and a side of faux bacon, which many, many uh, grocery stores now carry these meat alternative products. Instead of fried potatoes, you could enjoy roasted potatoes with much less fat or steamed potatoes or even better. Instead of mutton stew, enjoy a hearty three sister stew with beans and corn and squash. And instead of ice cream, you can make Chef Lois's delicious blue corn mush parfait, which is available at the nativepowerplate.org website in uh, recipe booklet. So I mentioned fiber being filling, and I just want to really emphasize this. When you fill your stomach with whole grains and fruits and vegetables, your brain gets the message much quicker that it's full and it's time to stop eating. And if you just look at 500 calories from these different foods, so if you have 500 calories of oil in your stomach, you can see it does not fill your stomach very much. If you have 500 calories of cheese, it's going to fill it up a little bit more. 500 calories of meat, a little bit more. But look at the plant foods. 500 calories of grains and beans. That's a lot at one sitting. Or fruits and vegetables. You know That's going to really fill your, your stomach and make you feel satisfied. And I want to point out that although um, it was a native tradition to really celebrate foods from Mother Earth, foods from the ground, um, Often our doctors and healthcare professionals are not really emphasizing these foods in place of other troublemaker foods. But I want you to be aware that the American Medical Association in 2017 passed this resolution encouraging hospitals to serve plant-based meals and to eliminate processed meat from their menus. And many professional organizations now recommend a plant-based diet, including um, the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, and um, we just need to help get the word out about this healthy way of eating. Um, I want to share with you one final story. This is Mark Ramirez. Uh, he is a Hispanic uh, football player at um, the University of Michigan here in his, in his youth. Um, unfortunately, after he graduated from college, where he had a very successful successful career in football, um, he continued to eat like a football player. And you can see he got quite a bit heavier. Um, he married Kim, 
all of his siblings had diabetes except this one sister did not have diabetes. His mother who's pictured here received a kidney from this daughter who didn't have diabetes because her diabetes was out of control and she had kidney failure. This brother went blind. Um, this blood brother also had kidney failure. All of Mark's siblings had uncontrolled diabetes. And as the youngest member of the family, he was convinced you know, he was gonna get it and have all these problems. And that's exactly what happened. Um, he continued to eat like a football player, even though he wasn't playing football any longer. He gained a lot of weight. He ended up on 40 units of insulin a day and several medications. And he was really worried about ending up um, with all of these horrible complications. But fortunately, he learned about a plant-based diet. He changed his diet and um, he's lost weight. He's off all of his medications. And here are Mark and Kim together. And uh, they are enjoying a uh, plant-based lifestyle. So, you know, I always find this really inspiring um, to see what's possible. In the age of COVID-19, good nutrition has never been more important um, for preventing COVID or bad, bad outcomes of COVID. We, we know that people who um, have uncontrolled diabetes, who are overweight, who have other chronic diseases like high blood pressure, um, are more at risk of getting COVID infection or dying from it. So changing the diet now, if you were ever thinking that this was a good idea, this is a great time to do it. So let me just share it with you. I want to wrap up with some great resources. So first of all, there's some wonderful movies. And if you are quarantining at home right now, it's a great time to watch these. Forks Over Knives is a favorite. What the Health is a great movie. A movie called The Invisible Vegan is about African-American experience with a, a chronic disease and plant-based diets. And The Game Changers is a movie that's directed towards men and it's about the macho nature of eating fruits and vegetables and beans and how um, even some uh, very, very expert uh, athletes are thriving on a plant-based diet. Um, I wanna encourage you to take a screenshot of, of this uh, resource. Um, this is a brand new movie. It's going to be shared Monday night. It'll be at eight, um, eight mountain time and followed by a discussion. And um, I was notified about this movie by Francis Moore LePay, who wrote the book Diet for a Small Planet, which was the very first book I ever read about eating plant-based. This was back in the 1980s. And Gather is a movie about the fight to revitalize our native food ways. So, whoops, I'm thinking this might be of interest to this audience. I haven't seen it, but it's a free screening and you can go to this website and register uh, to see it. And um, it looks like part of this might be cut off. So I'll um, put this in the comments or you can contact me for if, if you have trouble finding this link. Okay, um, another really good resource, I've mentioned uh, this a couple times and I've put the website in the chat, nativepowerplate.org is where you'll find all kinds of great resources that have been developed over years in partnership with um, people like Chef Lois and Chef Walter and uh, Navajo Nation nutritionists and uh, nutritionist health educators from the eight northern pueblos and I've pictured here uh, the beautiful recipe booklets that uh, Lois and Walter have contributed to and you can download these uh, there's no cost and beautiful photography and I hope you'll enjoy these great resources there's also a number of videos and uh, web there's a webinar on cooking to combat COVID-19 at this website and then the last resources there is an app you can download for your phone called the 21 Day Vegan Kickstart. And uh, this has 21 days of recipes, meal plans, grocery lists, uh, check that out. So um, I am going to end by just reminding you about these dramatic lessons about nutrition from around the planet and from your own ancestral traditions. And I wanna encourage you to try out a plant-based way of eating. Thank you very much and I will end there. Most excellent. This has been amazing. Always, always amazing to, I got all these little questions here, you know, tech, traditional ecological knowledge, 
um, what would we say is just grandma's, what grandma said. That's what I, I re, um, kind of define that as, or what grandpa said, you know, how they shared and, you know, so, and then the, um, <clears throat> the, the SAD diet, I love that acronym. <laughs> That was pretty so good. So true. <laughs> That's a good acronym. I'm excited that we were able to record this um, this presentation. So much valuable information for our participants in our life program and any participants that come to NACA. We're so thankful that uh, Chef Lois, Chef Walter, and Dr. Carolyn were here tonight to join us. Uh, I know it's really late in the East Coast. We appreciate you being here, even at this late hour, your late hour there. Um, there wasn't, I, I had a question, um, choke cherries, you're growing choke cherries? You, you've cultivated them? Interesting. What, um, what I mean, what, did you start seeds? How did you do that? So there's a native nursery from uh, Santa Ana Pueblo and they, uh, the nursery grows plants, uh, little starts. And I take my indigenous food class there every year. And so we got little starts from the nursery and um, planted them and they, they have suckers. So if they like where it is, they just started spreading and they've spread all along the house. We have the canales all along the side and, uh, we have tons and tons of choke cherries. So they would grow perfectly in Flagstaff. They like cold. Mm -hmm. They like the north side. They did not like the south side of the house. They just didn't grow well there. They would only grow on the north side. And every year, tons of them, we leave some for the birds, some for the other animals, some so that it can repropagate, and then we harvest the remainder. So uh, we've done very well many years in a row. So you said it was... Um enriched with vitamin C, right? Vitamin C, it's got tons of antioxidants. Uh, I, some people call them sour cherry, uh, but, um, and there are a lot of pit, there's a lot of pit in there, mm -hmm. but we actually take some of the pit and blend that into the sauce. Uh, there's a, a young high school student that's done a lot of research. Uh, um, she was in the science grant uh, on the seed. So the seeds also have antioxidants, anti-cancer, anti-disease uh, um, properties. And so we use some of that seed by pounding it or blending it into the, the, the rest of the fruit. I love it because, you know, um, up in South Dakota, the Minnesota, all those places it grows. So yeah, it would grow here in Flagstaff. And, you know, we, we really want to do, um, share information with our community on those um, uh, uh, plant foods um, that will help people during this COVID time. So, I mean, and we have garden space, you see behind Shanri, that's one of our spaces there. And um, it's really a beautiful section. And we're just trying to get ideas for um, what to plant. You know, do you have any suggestions on any other plant foods that might be able to grow here in Flagstaff? We're doing white corn, blue corn. Um, chime in, Shanri, if you want to. Um, I, I, um, I think she's doing squashes, um, winter squash and summer squash. Um, we did the three sisters, we did different beans. Um, but understanding the nutritional value, the uh, medicinal value of these foods is something that we'd be really, really interested in and uh, being able to share. So this presentation tonight really provided a lot of that information. Thank you so much. Well, um, I'll try, when the nursery opens up, I'll try and uh, find out how we can get you some starts. And the next time we drive out there, bring them out to you so you can, uh, I know uh, one of my students brought some home to uh, North Dakota and she started, uh, and another student from a previous year uh, to South Dakota to get those choke cherries back into those communities. So we will work on uh, what else we think would grow there and try and get starts for you. And I also love the um, dry, the um, fry bread. Fry, what did you call it? <laughs> no fry fry bread. 
<laughs> we need to bring that more and more to um, our population and sharing that. And it's amazing how one time I was talking about it on a webinar and I, I really uh, offended some people um, in that they were saying, um, you know, it might not be traditional to you, but it might not be traditional in, in the context that it was something that we ate a long time ago, but after we had to survive, that's when it became traditional. And so I, I really um, love the idea of being able to introduce that no fry fry bread in, in a good way, you know, to some of those people, you know, like Chef Walter, you know, my goodness, what an inspiring story to, you know, just say, okay, I'm going to change my diet. And he does it, you know, this is going to be a good presentation to share over and over. So thank you for sharing that story. Amazing. And as always, Dr. Carolyn, you're amazing. You're so amazing. The, the medical information that you share with us helps us connect, like Chef Lois was saying, you know, bridging that information, the traditional westernized science, it, it explains, it gives us names, and it helps us to think and connect that way. As always, thank you so much. Well, I, you're very welcome. It's a delight to get to talk to, to you as always. You know, it occurred to me, I didn't mention anything about uh, medications uh, and the, the, what might happen if somebody makes a major change in their diet, but they're taking medication for their diabetes or their blood pressure. And as you've heard me say before, all of a sudden those medications can become too strong. And somebody who's never had low blood sugar or never had low blood pressure may all of a sudden have symptoms of that. So I always wanna really encourage people to follow up closely with their healthcare professional and work with them to cut back on those medications. It doesn't mean the diet's bad for you. It just means you no longer need so much medication or maybe even any medication at all. That's really good. Thank you for that insight. Are you growing kale in your garden? We are. Oh, good. So that was a vegetable. My mom never made kale, um, but it's one that I have come to absolutely adore. And I know it grows well into the uh, cold weather. And I actually had it for breakfast this morning. I, I eat it as often as I can. And I you know, love to have it uh, cut up in the refrigerator and I can just throw it in a pan and steam it really quickly. And I like to put a little balsamic vinegar on it or a little lime juice. Delicious, super healthy. Highly recommend it with your bowl of oatmeal in the morning. I think the first time I met with you and we had a presentation, you talked about water frying. And that's the first time I'd ever heard of water frying. Yeah. And that's how I cook my eggs with the kale every in the mornings. It's amazing. I love yeah, it. You don't need all that oil. Oil is a highly processed food full of extra calories. So it's great just to um, turn the heat down a little bit, use a little bit of water in the pan. Well, thank you so much. Is there any questions from any of the um, participants? If you'd like to unmute and ask any questions, you can um, hit your mute button um, and ask any question that you'd like. It appears everyone's well informed. <laughs> well, once again, we thank Sean Ray for being in the back there and taking care of us with the Zoom. Yay, Sean Ray. Yep, that's right, Dr. Carolyn. And we really appreciate you all coming and participating tonight with us. Thank you, Tellerita, for um, representing us and um, introducing everyone. Well, have a great evening, everyone. And we will have this program recorded and available on the life page, which is at www.nakainc.org slash life. You'll be able to see the presentations there. Thank you. <laughs>